Hello, everyone, and thank you for watching. Uh, today's uh, presentation is a little bit different. Uh, we were going to do this on Facebook as usual, but uh, of course, Facebook was down at the exact moment that Irene was supposed to be presenting her presentation. So we've recorded it and uploaded it uploaded it since then. Uh, so thank you uh, for watching. And uh, today's presentation is called Building a Legacy from the Tower of Freedom to Ekbers, uh, which is in celebration of Ekbers' 20th anniversary, which happens this month. Our guest speaker is author, educator, activist, local historian, and president of the Essex County Black Historical Research Society, Irene Moore Davis, who will be pr presenting right here in the museum's permanent gallery. She was born and raised in Windsor, Ontario, and holds a Bachelor of Arts Honours in English, Language and Literature from the University of Windsor, a Bachelor of Education from the University of Western Ontario, and a Master of Arts in English Language and Literature from Queen's University. Currently, she is an administrator at St. Clair College. Irene is extremely active and involved in the community. As mentioned, she is the president of the Essex County Black Historical Research Society, chair of the annual Buxton History and Genealogy Conference, programming chair at Windsor Books at Bookfest Windsor, and has given many, many presentations on Black Canadian history, both throughout Essex County and the province. This is in addition to being an author of the forthcoming book, Our Own Two Hands, a Black History, or a History of Black Lives in Windsor from 1700s forward. We are very excited to hear Irene give her presentation and we hope you enjoy. Uh, this time, uh, the question and answer period is going to be a bit different because this is recorded. Irene can't um, answer any questions because no one else is here but us. So just type in any questions you have and Irene will monitor our page for questions for the next couple of days uh, after it's posted. So again, just type in your questions and Irene will respond when she has a moment. Uh, so we are very excited to hear Irene present and let's get started. Well, thank you for the warm introduction. It is always a pleasure to be here on site at the Amherstburg Freedom Museum. As many people around me know, I practically grew up in this museum and uh, my mom, uh, the late great uh, E. Andrea Moore was on the founding board of directors. I spent many Saturdays and Sundays and evenings here doing my homework and exploring the exhibits and eavesdropping as lots of great conversations about history happened. And so it's very fitting that this presentation is actually taking place here um, because the presentation is very much about uh, my family lineage, as well as the, the Tower of Freedom Monument, the International Underground Railroad Memorial, and of course the Essex County Black Historical Research Society, all things that were very much tied to my late mother. So I'm happy to share some thoughts. We are on the verge of the 20th anniversary of the International Underground Railroad Memorial. And the International Underground Railroad Memorial, as you I'm sure are aware, consists of two wonderful pieces of public art. The Gateway to Freedom in Detroit, which is located in Hart Plaza right alongside the Detroit River, and the Tower of Freedom in Windsor, Ontario in the Civic Green, part of the Civic Esplanade. And the very interesting, one of the very interesting facts about that uh, international monument, the only one of its kind in the world, is that the genesis of the monument was um, something that came out of a, a mystery, kind of a whodunit. And something else that's very interesting about that monument story is that the monument was the genesis of the Essex County Black Historical Research Society. So let me explain what I mean by all of that. This presentation is going to kind of take a look at how the monument came about, how the Essex County Black Historical Research Society came about, and some other bits of information that you might find interesting along the way. So let me share my screen here. All right, so I want to begin by giving a shout out to the wonderful Angela Gitalini, who is an, an, an Underground Railroad uh, descendant from Windsor, Ontario, and who created our new logo for us in uh, celebration of the march towards our 20th anniversary. Just a bit of clarification, the Essex County Black Historical Research Society was formally founded in January 20, or sorry, January 2002. So we'll technically be celebrating the 20th anniversary of the ECBHRS in January of next year. But the Tower Freedom Monument, the Gateway to Freedom Monument, 
the International Underground Railroad Memorial was dedicated on October 20th, 2001. So that is the 20th anniversary that we are celebrating this month. And we're going to move towards celebrating um, our own organization's history um, very shortly. So how did this story begin? Well, it began with a mystery. Um, in 1999, there was a lot of controversy, frankly, in Windsor, Ontario. There was um, a desire on the part of, uh, of many to um, protect the Norwich block, the historic Norwich block, which sat at the corner of Olette and Riverside. And many people that were interested in, in uh, historic buildings and the heritage of the area were deeply um, concerned that it was about to be torn down uh, to make way for the Candarel Tower uh, for the new Chrysler Canada headquarters and, and other um, occupants to be part of that uh, tower project. And so um, that did happen. And, and there was, of course, uh, a long process of, you know, um, getting everyone out of the respective businesses and buildings that made up the historic Norwich block. But what does that have to do with this story? Well, on the uh, front of the former Dominion Bank at the corner of Olette and Riverside, that's where there was a federal heritage plaque about the Underground Railroad. It was placed there in 1973. And many of us in 1999, as the preparations for the demolition of the Norwich block were underway, started to notice that the heritage plaque had disappeared. Well, of course it had to disappear, it had to go somewhere, but no one knew where it had gone. And so many calls were made and emails sent and lots of people were scurrying around trying to figure out where the plaque had gone. And my mom reached out to Parks Canada and finally we got the word that the plaque had been moved to Fort Malden for temporary safekeeping. So there was at that time interest in finding a new repository for the plaque. And so my mother, E. Andrea Moore, convened a meeting of interested parties from the Black community in Windsor and uh, Parks Canada and folks from the city of Windsor to start to talk about where that heritage plaque should be placed now that the building to which it had been affixed was about to go away. And initially, believe it or not, the discussion was about finding a big rock, <laughs> finding some sort of big rock or boulder and affixing it to that and placing it down at the river. And then there began to be discussions of perhaps um, obtaining a cairn to which it could be affixed. But then, because we had an opportunity to look at the wording of the plaque through fresh eyes, you know, we had been accustomed to this plaque since 1973, it had been there, um, but we had a chance to look at it through fresh eyes and realize that there was some inaccurate information in the plaque as it was. There was certainly um, some very anachronistic language, terms that would have been considered okay in 1973, were not as okay in 1999. So this is what the original plaque read. Fugitive slaves was the topic to start with. From early in the 19th century and particularly after the passage of the American fugitive slave law, fugitive slave law in 1850, the towns along the Detroit River served as major terminals of the network of routes by which thousands of slaves reached Canada. Once in Canada, the fugitive was often aided by philanthropic societies and individuals in securing land, employment, and the necessaries of life. In some cases, separate colonies were established for former slaves. By 1861, an estimated 30,000 fugitive slaves resided in Canada West, but more than half of them returned to the United States following emancipation. Well, you can see that there are some obvious problems with the wording of that plaque as it had existed. For one thing, we don't refer to people as fugitive slaves anymore. Um, in 1973, that was still in common use, but by the end of the 20th century, that was no longer accepted terminology. 
And so we were interested in referring to freedom seekers or um, you know, refugees from slavery. But we also understood by this point in the 20th century that the people who came to Canada West and other parts of Canada were uh, not only formerly enslaved people, but free people of African descent who were fleeing from oppressive conditions and black codes and things of that nature. So their story was not mentioned here. Towns along the Detroit River was rather an unfortunate reduction of the whole under, Underground Railroad story because certainly there were many routes through which people entered Canada on the Underground Railroad. Um, although the Detroit River is clearly one of the most important, which is why that federal heritage plaque was here and is here now. And we also realized that there were issues with um, focusing so much on philanthropic societies and individuals, um, as opposed to centering the agency of these freedom seekers and other people of African descent themselves. Um, separate colonies being established for former enslaved people was something that didn't necessarily need to be highlighted as much because a very small percentage of 19th century African Canadians lived in separate colonies. And certainly we wanted to you know, question that figure that more than half of them returned to the United States following emancipation. So there were a lot of issues with this. And so our committee worked um, pretty extensively with Shannon Ricketts at Heritage Canada, a wonderful historian um, that uh, uh, was very, she was very involved in creating um, the new language for a new plaque um, in consultation with the Underground Railroad Monument Committee of Windsor, because by this point we had started to give ourselves this name. So that's kind of the mystery that resulted in the genesis of this entire enterprise. These are notes from the July 29, 1999 first meeting of citizens concerned about the Underground Railroad plaque at Olette Avenue and Riverside Drive. We met at Sandwich First Baptist Church, and you'll see that Reverend Owen Bury was there, Andrea Moore, myself, Irene Moore, I didn't have a Davis at that point, Nancy Allen, Pat Alexander, Phil Alexander, and Ruth Ann Shad. And this is how it uh, began. Um, you'll see that we were uh, starting to be very interested in talking about a cairn being placed at Dieppe Park to hold the plaque. Elise Harding Davis from the North American Black Historical Museum, as it was then known, was not um, in, involved directly in the monument committee, but she did often comment and, and was often consulted. Um, we talked about getting an artist potentially to come up with something a little bit better than a cairn or a stone, but we really um, had no idea how big this project was going to become. And so as we started to have meetings, sometimes bi-weekly, um, but often monthly, um, we began to become aware of a few things. One was that Detroit 300 was getting underway. Detroit 300, as some of you will recall, was this momentous endeavor that focused on celebrating the tricentennial of Detroit in terms of its uh, European uh, colonial past. Certainly there was indigenous uh, presence far beyond, you know, beyond 1701 prior to that, but, but Detroit 300 was the big tricentennial celebration that was planned for the entire year of 2001 with many more events between June and December 2001. And through Dr. Barbara K. Smith, um, who is a relative of ours and who was very involved in our committee by this point, and through um, uh, a wonderful individual at the city of Windsor, Nancy Morand, who was the heritage planner at that time, we came to understand that Detroit 300 involved a component that was looking for a way to honor that city's underground railroad history and that a committee had been formed on the Detroit side under the leadership of Sharon Sexton. And so there was interest in talking to one another and seeing maybe whether we could come up with a plan to honor both sides of the Underground Railroad story. And this is how the idea of the bi-national monument 
came about. So as those discussions happened and the two committees began to communicate more and uh, certainly with uh, lots of facilitation by Faye Langmaid and uh, Deborah Green at the um, Detroit 300 organization, there was a tremendous uh, amount of energy that started to uh, form around this idea. And there was an opportunity through the excellent infrastructure of the Detroit 300 organization to engage in some major fundraising. We had on our side considered approaching some philanthropic families and seeing if we could get some money towards a monument or a cairn or a statue of some kind but we never envisioned the scale of what this binational monument was to become. So Detroit 300 uh, was you know, technically around July of 2001 because that's when allegedly the city was founded, July 24th, 1701. But there were many components over the course of a year to this celebration. And so um, the two committees under the facilitation of Detroit 300 began to talk about how uh, we might be able to generate this binational monument. A decision was made to uh, put out a request for proposals from artists on both sides of the border. So American and Canadian sculptors had an opportunity to put forward proposals. Those who were shortlisted were given some funding to come up with a maquette um, so that we could see in 3D what the uh, monuments would look like. But a wonderful proposal was submitted by none other than Ed Dwight, former astronaut, incredible African-American sculptor who has really created wonderful uh, works of public art all over North America at this point. And so Ed Dwight um, was the successful applicant and we were so thrilled to work with him. The amount of energy, effort, research, thought and intention that he had put into his proposal for the monument was very evident. And this is actually a copy of the design proposal. Um, it's part of the Essex County Black Historical Research Society's holdings at this point in our archives. And you'll see that he begins with, my design approach is based on the historical premise that groups of slaves made their way through the various underground routes to the Detroit River terminus, he meant Underground Railroad, and transported by ferry to the Windsor Shore and Freedom. To some degree, that was true. It is also based on the enactment of the 1850 Fugitive Slave Law that made escaped slaves vulnerable to recapture in the northern states, which necessitated escape to Canada. Although some enclaves of enslaved African labor did exist in Canada, it was not the law of the land, and the newly arrived slaves found a country of refuge. So he had done some research. And he really had this wonderful overall design concept. In these two US Canadian Underground Railroad memorials, I have attempted to present in visual form the final stages of the Underground Railroad movement with Detroit depicted as the gateway to freedom. The design features a principal sculpture of slaves awaiting transport to Canada in a setting that acknowledges Detroit's history and active citizen participation. The Canadian sculpture component represents the slaves arrival and reception into Canada and the slaves first realization of the actuality of freedom, the concept of the international flame of freedom as a central theme of the Underground Railroad phenomenon is used metaphorically throughout the design. Finally, the overall memorial design provides an opportunity to educate an international audience to the actuality of the movement, how it worked and who the key participants were. The iconic images I have proposed will hopefully stimulate a larger body of interest and reading by children and adults alike. This is the amount of thought that Mr. Dwight put into that proposal. And so with little surprise, he was the successful applicant. This was part of his proposal. He had uh, sort of given us an, a, a very basic idea of what this international flame of freedom uh, design might uh, look like in the context of this tower. And he certainly had uh, prepared a wonderful uh, maquette that, as you can see, um, already had in it the nucleus of what the Tower of Freedom monument looks like. 
including the little girl on the back who is gazing back across the water, contemplating her eventual return and feeling wistful and you know, longing for, for her uh, place of origin. Um, he very shortly thereafter began to uh, send wonderful information in terms of the dimensions and we could see uh, how the work was coming along. He kept everyone very well updated. So in January, 20, January of 2001, we had an opportunity to appear before city council to obtain approval for the Underground Railroad Monument and plaque in the Civic Esplanade. That location was selected by the folks at the city of Windsor. They were very much um, invested at that point in creating a Civic Esplanade um, that extended from City Hall to Riverside Drive and that would um, refer in a number of ways to the historic footprint of the McDougal Street Corridor, the original place in Windsor where so many of the formerly enslaved people and free people of African descent from America settled. That was also intended to refer to the ferry landing. And it was intended to refer to the barracks, the abandoned barracks that were on what is now City Hall Square in Windsor and where um, basically a refugee reception center was set up uh, at the height of the waves of uh, immigration into Windsor of uh, people of African descent from the US and where Marianne Shad set up her first school in Windsor, uh, where formerly enslaved people could stay briefly to get oriented, to get some medical treatment for you know, the difficulties that they had uh, um, encountered uh, physically through their you know, difficult journey, um, where they could get some sort of settlement services at a basic level and have an opportunity to find out about housing and employment and so on. So uh, that was never a long-term place for people to stay, by the way. It really was meant as a transitional option for them. And so uh, with a lot of assistance from Councillor Fulvio Valentinus, who many of you would now know as the uh, current uh, chair of the Windsor-Essex Catholic District School Board, but at that point he was a city councillor, and with lots of help, as mentioned from Nancy Morand, um, and Jessica Bennett at the City of Windsor at that time, um, our, uh, our committee did uh, receive recommendations to uh, have the monument placed in the Civic Green and that's uh, sort of why it was chosen. So it was um, something that uh, was not without controversy. Some people did want the monument to be down at the river, but this is where the city of Windsor wished to have it. And it was a gift to the city of Windsor, to the people of Windsor, and uh, very much was funded in a big way by what was then Casino Windsor, what is now Caesars Windsor, and next, right next to adjacent to their buildings. So we were absolutely thrilled uh, to get approval for that. And preparations began for the big day, the dedication of the two halves of the International Underground Railroad Memorial. Now I have to tell you, one of the highlights of that special day was Aretha Franklin singing Amazing Grace on the Detroit side. And now I'm going to pause to tell you a funny story about that. <laughs> so we um, went over in a bus uh, with uh, MP Susan Whalen, Mayor Mike Hurst, uh, dignitaries of, of various kinds. Um, we went from the Detroit side in a bus, uh, sorry, from the Windsor side in a bus to the uh, Detroit side for the 10 a.m. dedication that day, Saturday, October 20th, 2001, of the U.S. side of the monument. And um, as, uh, as the monument was being unveiled, uh, the crowd really rushed in towards the monument. There was so much um, energy and so much interest that people just sort of crushed together and, and uh, sort of uh, became like a big, happy, grateful mob of folks <laughs> all swarming around the monument. This caused my mother and Aretha Franklin to be 
pushed together belly to belly. <laughs> and my mother, if any of you remember her, was a very calm, professional, dignified woman, 99% of the time, I have to say. But in that moment when she was up against Aretha Franklin, she really lost her composure and began fangirling and screamed, I love you, Aretha. And Aretha said, that's okay, baby. So that was a moment I'll never forget. But more importantly, it was a great celebration, not only of the unveiling of this binational monument, but of the nature of the Underground Railroad of the two communities on both sides of the Detroit River, uh, you know, that were so instrumental in that movement um, and of the pride, dignity, determination, courage, and all of that other stuff of the freedom seekers themselves. And that was just a tremendous celebration. Um, one of the things that was really neat about the Detroit unveiling uh, event the morning of the uh, 20th of October was that the monument in Detroit was actually covered in a series of quilts that had been uh, created by various um, artists and groups of African descent. One of them was a freedom quilt that was put together by representatives of all of the Underground Railroad era congregations uh, in the black community in Windsor and Essex County. And that quilt is also part of the ECBHRS holdings at this point. And it was just wonderful to see you know, the, the uh, remarkable symbolism of those quilts covering the monument. As you can imagine, given the size of the monument, it was a lot of quilts <laughs> that had been sort of uh, fixed together to uh, cover the monument. And then after that event, we crossed back over to the Windsor side for 2 p.m. I have to tell you, if you're putting this in historical context, this happened just a little over a month after 9-11. And so the planning for these two um, unveilings really ran into some bumps as a result of that obviously horrific event and the closure of the border, uncertainty about whether people would be able to cross freely and so on. So we were very fortunate um, that arrangements were able to be made for us to be able to cross um, in a bus with a police escort with all of the uh, dignitaries on the bus and not to have to go through the level of um, screening and delays that a lot of people were going through at that time. So there was a lot of energy around the monument unveiling on both sides of the river. This is just an example of the wonderful save the date cards that went out uh, on the American side and, and to some of us here on the Canadian side regarding the Detroit unveiling. Uh, this was one of the fans that were produced in conjunction with the uh, event. Uh, if you're not familiar in uh, African Canadian and African American culture, um, fans are often something associated with uh, our church events and uh, funerals and things of that nature. Um, many of us uh, grew up having fans that look a lot like this uh, at our various uh, events, especially of a religious nature. So some commemorative fans were produced in conjunction with this and many people still have them to this day. Day, and it uh, had a wonderful um, overview of some of the affiliated events um, on the fan. This is the uh, invitation that went out regarding the Windsor uh, unveiling and uh, the French side was, uh, was uh, the French text was on the other side. Uh, Sheila Copps was at that point, the Minister of Canadian Heritage. Uh, she was not uh, at the event, but there were certainly many dignitaries present. And so we were very excited, um, not only about the unveiling of the plaque, but the unveiling of the Tower of Freedom monument. This was the program for the monument unveiling on the Windsor side. Um, again, because it was a Canadian heritage plaque that was the genesis of all of this and that is affixed to the monument. It was Parks Canada that uh, sent out these invitations and sent out, uh, prepared the program. 
and we worked very closely with them, of course. This was the program of events, uh, the, the sort of itinerary or program for October 20th, 2001 in Windsor. You can see all of the folks who were involved uh, in that program. And um, we were just so very proud of how that event went, all of us who were involved. People who arrived at the event were greeted by a majestic choir um, led by the late, great Naomi Banks and the choir sang beautiful spirituals on the courthouse steps just uh, adjacent to Charles Clark Square. And people just, you know, uh, gathered around and heard this beautiful singing. And there were people who didn't even know what was going on, but who just stopped and, and heard this wonderful, wonderful music. And that was really uh, going on for almost an hour ahead of the event. So that was beautiful. As you can see, there was a tremendous crowd at uh, both sides of the unveiling, but this is a picture from the Windsor unveiling. Uh, a lot of people were present. And it was so wonderful to see that turnout. People came from near and far. I've thrown in a picture of my dear friend and a historian many of us adore, Carolyn Smards Frost, who came all the way from, I believe, Collingwood for that event. And uh, she's there with a wonderful Parks Canada representative that we really enjoyed working with as well. Um, the late, great J. Lyle Browning, former president of this museum, uh, was one of our committee members. And, and I've, I've chosen this uh, picture because, uh, not just because I want to be in a slide, <laughs> but because um, J. Lyle Browning was a wonderful mentor and you know, tremendously helpful in getting this uh, project off the ground as he was with the museum project uh, many years ago. But also so that you can see the way that the Tower of Freedom monument was veiled prior to its unveiling uh, in conjunction with dynamic displays and some other suppliers, we managed to have a massive um, kente cloth uh, veil created a cover created for the monument. It was sort of a, a monument cozy, if you will, and it was tremendous to see it there. And, uh, you know, Howard, the late uh, great Dr. Howard McCurdy was also part of our committee there. He is with my dad and with Guy Allen, who was certainly uh, helpful at times. Um, the uh, procession towards the dedication ceremony was marvelous. The late Brian Kersey in his role as town crier uh, played a very significant role. You see Dr. Richard Alway from the Historic Mo uh, Sites and Monuments Board, Nancy Allen, a very active committee member, Reverend Owen Bury. Uh, you see um, Susan Whalen, MP, uh, Mayor Mike Hurst, Edsel Ford the second, and of course, my mom. And um, it was a, a tremendous event, absolutely. These are the closing remarks when the plaque uh, was unveiled or a, a mock-up of the plaque was unveiled. That's Dr. Richard always speaking. And this is the actual unveiling of the monument 20 years ago. Uh, Dennis Archer, Edsel Ford II, Ed Dwight, the sculptor, of course, Mayor Mike Hurst, and my mom, E. Andrea Moore, participated in uh, actually tugging the ropes that uh, unveiled the monument. And there they all are in front of the monument immediately following the unveiling. And so when we look at the monument itself, um, there is so much that we can say about it. That little girl on the back is such a poignant uh, component of this monument. Uh, the way that she is looking back across the river. It's not merely that she's looking back at America, um, symbolizing people that longed to return to be reunited with their families and friends and the places that they knew once slavery ended, but it's also the very specific way in which this was engineered by Mr. Dwight, brilliant individual that he is, which I'll talk about in a moment. I want to share this uh, photo from the uh, reception following the unveiling at the casino. The late uh, Daphne Clark um, was also a very key member of our committee and she uh, succeeded my mother as president of the Essex County Black Historical Research Society later on. 
So the placement of the monument in the civic green, uh, again, people sometimes ask, why is it there? Why is it not down on the river? But I have identified the reasons why it was placed there. And we once again have to uh, always remember that the casino was so instrumental in paying for this monument and sponsoring the land on which it actually stands. Um, there is next to the monument something that I find hilarious, but it's a, it's a stone that uh, lists the members of the Underground Railroad Monument Committee. And uh, so that's, you know, that's helpful in terms of, you know, just a, a reference point for anyone who wonders who was involved in this uh, endeavor. Um, I forgot to mention Rob Watt earlier from Parks Canada. He was certainly very helpful, but a lot of people were just so helpful. The late Dr. Norm Becker was very gracious as he was in assisting with this museum project and certainly the Nazri AME church restoration here at the museum. Um, with respect to the monument, he and many engineering students were involved in making sure that the monument was properly installed um, on the base um, and that it was structurally sound with the installation and and he did so much pro bono work uh, for the black community, for black historic causes, for All Saints Anglican Church, I have to say, and for many other worthy um, causes. So we remember him with great gratitude. So the monument, as you can see, if you've never been to the Tower of Freedom Monument, the Canadian Heritage plaque uh, to which I referred earlier and which was really the genesis of all of this is affixed there in English and French. That is where the Canadian Heritage plaque about the Underground Railroad now sits. And as you can see, the landscaping um, behind the monument, the landscaping between the monument and Riverside Drive is meant to refer to the waves of the Detroit River, very much placing this monument in context as um, an homage or a tribute to the role that the Detroit River played in the Underground Railroad as well. And now you can see that uh, there have been some trees added and stuff. Um, it's aesthetically pleasing, although it does somewhat take away from the storytelling around the river waves coming from uh, Riverside Drive, but uh, it is wonderful that the city keeps up the area so well. So this is a plaque that you'll find down at the monument, just referring to the artist, um, mentioning that there is a companion work, Gateway to Freedom in Detroit, and it is uh, described as a Detroit 300 project. So you'll see that, um, that that logo is there along with the city of Windsor logo, Casino Windsor Cares, because at that time that's what the casino was called. And it's identified as a project with Detroit 300 and the Underground Railroad Monument Committee of Windsor, which was us. This is the text that resulted from all of the consultation and discussion. The Underground Railroad in Canada, as opposed to fugitive slaves, from the early 19th century until the American Civil War, settlements along the Detroit and Niagara Rivers were important terminals of the Underground Railroad. White and Black abolitionists formed a heroic network dedicated to helping free and enslaved African Americans find freedom from oppression. By 1861, some 30,000 freedom seekers resided in what is now Ontario, after secretly traveling north from slave states like Kentucky and Virginia. Some returned south after the outbreak of the Civil War, but many remained helping to forge the modern Canadian identity, a big improvement over the 1973 plaque text. And that initial image that I showed you from Ed Dwight's proposal, he did bring that to fruition. Keeping the flame of freedom alive is very much a theme on both sides of the monument, the uh, International Underground Railroad Memorial. So the flame motif appears on both sides. Um, he did refer to very much wanting to convey the emotions that people would have felt when they arrived. You see some trepidation, um, some uncertainty on the face of the woman who's holding her baby. You see someone who is an abolitionist or a helper of some kind, giving her some sense of assurance. You see the man rejoicing and expressing great jubilation, relief, um, all of those things, all of those emotions upon arriving in the promised land. 
And still to this day, just people react so much to the expression on that gentleman's face in the sculpture. Um, often when I show this uh, picture or, or other pictures to classes, to students, to school children, to uh, new Canadians, to whomever I'm speaking, they really comment on identifying with, with this man on the front uh, face of the monument. But there's a lot of nuance there. Um, so much that you can really explore if you go and actually stand at the foot of the monument and take the time to really take it all in. The little girl on the back is not just gazing off into the distance. She is gazing very specifically at the gateway to freedom. She is gazing at Georges de Baptiste on the U.S. side who is pointing directly at her because on the U.S. side in the gateway to freedom, Georges de Baptiste, who was, as many of you know, a real life abolitionist and sort of president of the Detroit uh, Vigilance Committee, he is uh, there showing some freedom seekers the way to the promised land, to, to Windsor. And uh, so much uh, detail and nuance in every component of the Detroit sculpture as well. So excellent, still extraordinary. We regret that there's been some vandalism and some damage on the Detroit side and are looking forward to seeing that rectified with repairs soon. But yes, you can see all of, all of that uh, sense of wonder, uncertainty and hope in the figures on the US side as well. We had an opportunity to create some space around the base of the monument to help with the storytelling. So one of the things that we did uh, as a committee was to reach out to members of the black community and to historical societies and to uh, members and the board of this museum and to ask for suggestions about what they would like to see on the base of the monument. Something that came forward very uh, um, strongly was a desire to name some of the Underground Railroad participants and operatives that are known from our part of, uh, of the country, from our region. There are many, many people who could have been named on the base of the monument. Sometimes there are questions about, well, how did these people get chosen and not those people? Um, it was basically a vote. Uh, we asked people in the community to, um, to share their suggestions for who should appear there and these were the names that came forward. We always have to remember that underground railroad participants and operatives, many of them we just don't know their names. It was a secret network, right? A secret network of routes and people committed to ending slavery, to helping slave, formerly enslaved people get to freedom, um, and, and certainly freedom seekers themselves. And so we don't often know all of their names we uh, are certainly cognizant of the fact that those individuals who had opportunities to tell their stories after danger had elapsed, um, who had access to the means of production of storytelling, who had access to presses, the ability to write books, uh, the ability to you know, talk about uh, their roles. Uh, they were often male, they were often people of European descent, um, Many of the other operatives and activist stories were not shared as widely, and so we don't know all of the names, and people did operate in secret as part of this, uh, this network. But these are the names that are presented on the base of the monument, and if there are any that you don't recognize, I encourage you to look them up because they are all very interesting people with very interesting stories. We also had an opportunity to name some of the Underground Railroad areas of settlement, so we focused on those that were nearby, but there were certainly many others that could have been named, and sometimes um, there have been uh, suggestions that perhaps uh, additional additional um, engraving could take place to add some of these settlements that are missing. But what I would say to that is that these are presented in alphabetical order, right? That is, uh, that is how it was designed. And this is just a photo from the 10th anniversary celebration that happened in 2011 with some of the original members of the Essex County Black Historical Research Society and of the Underground Railroad uh, Monument Committee of Windsor. One thing that I would say at the 10th uh, anniversary celebration, we were delighted by how many people came out to be part of that. 
10 years ago. COVID has meant that we've uh, canceled our gathering for this 20th anniversary, although we will have some virtual events, including this presentation that's happening now um, that people can enjoy to uh, help commemorate that remarkable anniversary. The Tower of Freedom monument, uh, the Tower of Freedom side of the monument certainly remains a gathering place that is well used. Uh, tours often stop there. Uh, tourists often stop there. Uh, school children, uh, field trips, things of that nature are often found there. And it's even used um, in protests um, on occasion. Um, it certainly was a focal point of some of the Black Lives Matter protests last year. It certainly um, has been used by those who are advocating for migrant workers and for other causes. Um, there was a, a demonstration there regarding food security at one point. Um, there was a demonstration there regarding, uh, or a public uh, education event there regarding refugees at one point that I had an opportunity to attend. And it's certainly been a focal point for emancipation celebrations in recent years. So it is well used, but always we want more people to know about it and to uh, seek it out and to really spend some time there learning about the Underground Railroad and this area's involvement in the Underground Railroad. It is a wonderful jewel that is a gift to the people of Windsor from Detroit 300, financed by the casino 20 years ago and uh, coordinated by these amazing volunteers who gave up so much of their time over a period of more than a year to uh, make this all happen. But I have to say, um, moving into the present day, when the Tower of Freedom Monument went up and its sister, the other half of the International Underground Railroad Memorial, the Gateway to Freedom, you know, all of us who had been involved in the uh, planning of the monument found that we really liked working together and we wanted to keep going. And so discussions happened over that fall. And in January of 2002, we had our inaugural meeting of the Essex County Black Historical Research Society. So as mentioned, we will be celebrating our 20th anniversary very soon. We're going to be uh, staging some various uh, components of the celebration over the year 2022, starting with our Black History Month kickoff. And I'm just so proud of the work that the Essex County Black Historical Research Society has continued to do for almost 20 years now. Um, many of you are familiar, but I will just touch on a few high points. Every year we uh, are involved in hosting or co-hosting um, a Black History Month kickoff. We uh, have done it the last several years in conjunction with the Amherstburg Freedom Museum and the Windsor West Indian Association. Originally, the North Star Cultural Community Center was also a partner on that endeavor. For over 15 years, we've been circulating a Black History Month activity schedule that helps people to keep track of all the great things happening during Black History Month. Certainly, we make lots of presentations and uh, visit a lot of classrooms and organizations to help educate the public about Black history. We've done a number of displays through the years in conjunction with the Windsor Public Library and other partners. We have had many opportunities to participate in um, helping to create public recognitions of Black history in conjunction with the City of Windsor Museum, Windsor Parks Canada, and so on, um, actually helping to write plaques and get plaques erected around the area um, and to make sure that our stories are told. And probably the most important thing that we do, aside from just providing information to researchers on an ongoing basis and maintaining our archives so that people can have access to records and so on. Um, the most important thing that we do is uh, definitely our work with the local school boards, I would say, not just in terms of going into classrooms and educating students and, and uh, helping to share Black history, but in continuously collaborating with them on resources that teachers can use themselves in the classroom. The best example of that being the African Canadian Roads to Freedom resource documents that help uh, teachers 
officially in the Greater Essex County District School Board, but actually in many other boards too, those documents help them to embed Black history in their classroom uh, lesson plans from grade one right through to grade 10. So we're so proud of that work and we've just completed an update to those resources. So that will be released, the new version will re be released in November of this year. So lots of great work is going on, um, continuing to walk in the footsteps of the uh, Underground Railroad Monument Committee of Windsor, but more importantly, continuing to walk in the footsteps of the many generations of African Canadian activists and archivists and community historians and some academic historians and educators who have kept our stories alive, making sure that they are safeguarded and circulated throughout the generations. So on that note, I'm going to close and we will again have an opportunity for you to post any comments, any questions that you have in the comment section once this is aired. And I will monitor that uh, comment section and uh, answer any questions that you have. Thank you so much.